this is the area where I had planned to start making contact is this area kind of over here but instead another incident took place um, just down here just give you another sense of what the mountains are like here and then I'll set the camera up on the tripod and, and talk you through what happened fairly steep mountains part of a range heading that way wish I could show you on a nice day in this blue sky but uh, we've got a cold front moving in and a storm so you're not going to see the mountains at their best anyway that's the area and typically I've come here for um, the conscious contact kind of experiments that I've been doing and usually I set up somewhere over there just a nice quiet spot that I like those of you who've read my blog and have heard me talk about the pig squealing alien typically I've heard that uh, creature moving through the bush here up from the creek uh, also there's a little revegetated forest at the back there and also the uh, main forest at the base there so kind of that whole stretch anyway uh, that's something else so I'll set this up and talk you through what happened hi again so I've come over walking past the kangaroos as I said into this area here and I'm facing this way and suddenly just kind of get this jolt it's not um, you know it's not immobilizing or anything like that but it's sudden and I see a, um, a very bright um, yellowy light on the ground and I look up and the light goes all the way up and above me is uh, an ovoid craft or vessel and I can see another one um, kind of slightly behind it but in the distance and it's a silvery black kind of motley sheen underneath and when I say ovoid I, I describe the other ones as ovoid but they're a longer kind of shape maybe those are the ones that people talk about as being cigar shape I'm not sure this was more kind of ovoid, um, elliptical. It wasn't pointy like the other one, totally different shape, kind of more like this shape rather than that sort of shape. I look up, I see the light and the craft, the two craft, and at the same time there's this... Uh, I uh, really struggle to try and describe this. There, uh, there's a sound, if you like, um, a set of tones, and, and there's two things going on at once, and I can discern this really quickly. There's an overall sound, and my body is responding to that, but the first thing that my body notices is the this light is a field of some sort, and there's this really strong electrostatic feeling running entirely through my body um, I can feel it everywhere and it's not um, it's not painful but it's unusual but at the same time this um, sound starts and as I say this sound is composed of two sounds first of all is a really deep sound um, and it's uh, modulated it's going through this rhythm of about a second I can't can't even you know I'm not a very good mimic so I can't make the sound very well but I guess it takes about a second maybe three quarters of a, of a second or something like that and it's a modulated sound it starts very deep you can sense that it's coming from the earth itself and I I think what I know is that it's coming from the entire mountain range. 
So the earth is making this deep modulating sound that starts deep and then goes higher. And at the same time there is a, um, a higher pitch, not really high, but a higher pitch. Um, and the two sounds together are merging, making kind of like a harmonic kind of sound of some sorts. And that's, I can feel that affecting my body. What I've got to tell you is when I look down from the light, I look down and I can see the little guys. And I'm not entirely sure how many of them there are, but I think most of the ones that followed me. And they're in a circle around me. And they're holding hands. And I guess they're probably no more than four or five meters away from me. And they're around me. And very quickly I realized that somehow they're creating um, the sound. I'm pretty sure that the earth itself is creating the deep sound and these guys are creating the other sound but I think they're working with one or both of the, the craft, the vessels. I, I don't know exactly what's going on but I just know at the time that they are controlling the overall sound. I, it might sound really corny to say it, but, and this is something a lot of people don't get with aliens, they have a really strong sense of interconnectedness and oneness, and they feel everything, so they feel not just the energetic connection with a planet, they feel the conscious connection with the planet. So part of my preparation for an event like this, though it wasn't necessary this time, but on other times it has been, is to connect with what I've called the spirits of the earth. I think I mentioned that up there before. And I didn't believe this concept. It was my partner that, that taught me about it. Um, and by that I guess I mean the conscious energy of um, living things, but not just living things, things that we don't take to be living, such as rocks, mountains and so on. So for me that means connecting with the, the plants, the, the soil, the ground, the rocks, the water, um, all the plants, including you know the shrubs, the grasses, the trees, uh, the air and the wind, you know, distinguish the two the separate things. So for me there's a felt connection with those things and I I sense from them that there is a felt connection with everything. And unless you've you're somebody who understands um, that sense of felt connection. You're not going to get what I'm saying. So these guys somehow are creating this sound and maybe the craft of the vessels are doing it using some kind of technology but, but here on the ground these guys are doing it with their bodies, with their minds, uh, with their hearts. They're just doing it you know, from a biological point of view. So a rough sense is um, I look up, I see the light, I see the craft, um, I look down, I see the guys around me in a ring and I hear the sound and the sound carries on for, you know, I don't, I don't have a sense of time at this point, I don't know how long the sound went for. It might have been a minute, it might have been two minutes, it might have been ten seconds, I don't know. But it was affecting my consciousness and it was affecting my physical state. I could feel that, um, you know, I had initially felt kind of nauseous again and I felt that it was affecting me and making things better. I felt like I was actually able to stay conscious. As I'm standing here in the ring and these guys are around me, and you have to realize it's, um, it's a very intimate thing to have a whole bunch of entities from another world standing around you and, and doing something for you. I don't know how to convey that, really. Um, 
but there's nothing like that at all. I think the only sense people could have is if they took, you know, 20 of the people that love them the most or care about them the most in the world and they sat at the, or they stood at the center of the circle and they felt that love radiating out towards them. And I know that sounds really cheesy in New Age, but that's the feeling. Well, that's an approximation of the feeling. Um, the sound continues and then um, I have a sense there's another light comes through the field but I'm not sure about that, I've got to revisit that and then two of the large uh, two of the tall aliens materialize in front of me and they're right here in the middle of the circle with me in front of me and as I said before these guys are tall, 14 or 15 feet. When I see them, I'm looking up, you know, like this. They're that, they're that big, you know, like, it's like looking up at a giraffe. You don't just stand there like this. I mean, you're looking at their legs at this height. You're looking right up to try and make eye contact with them. And I notice when that happens, um, it just catches out, catch out of my eye that others have materialized and I think all up there are six so I think there's four that I see out there four of the tall guys and then um, the circle is, has broken up and many of the little guys have gone over to the tall guys and they're talking I guess and it's quite strange because these tall guys I don't know if they do it out of sort of graciousness or respect or if there's some physical thing here they do, but they bend over to talk to the little guys. At least that's what it looks like. So you can imagine this creature who's, you know, three and a half, four foot, and then this other creature who's 14 or 15 foot bending over to talk to it. It's just very strange to see. It's not something we see in our world very often. I guess it's like a giraffe bending over, you know, for a little sheep or something like that. It's just really odd to look at. Um, so I noticed they're out there. What's really odd is, uh, as I said, it was after um, twilight, after dusk. It's on the way to being dark. But I can see everything, like it's all lit up. And I can't tell you whether or not it was actually lit up, like if another person was here, it would look lit up to them, or whether my eyes were seeing things differently because of what they were doing to me. I don't know, I don't have an answer to that. But I can see everything, I can, I can see the interaction over there and the two tall guys are in front of me and one of them comes up to me and takes my hand and um, says a few things to me and then sits me down and the other one, uh, I don't know what happened to the other one, I think the other one just moved slightly over here. What happened then was I sat down on the ground with the big guy in front of me, actually it wasn't a guy, it was, you know, trying to explain sex is really difficult, but I take it to be a female, a female in front of me, and remember I said there were three little guys that were close to me, two in particular, well they took a place either side of me, one on the left and one on the right, and you remember that I had questions and I had, um, you know, I had my, my camera, video camera and my SLR, uh, digital SLR, and I had my backpack on. I had all these things ready and these questions in my back pocket. And I don't remember thinking of any of that. I just remember sitting down with them. I'd already asked the little guys most of my questions. So I... I felt comfortable, I think, enough to ask 
the big guys, the questions. And it wasn't just, you know, you land, you sit down, suddenly you pull out all these questions and, you know, bang. There was uh, discussion and connection. And as I said before, when you connect with these aliens, It's not like when you and I connect. Um, when you connect with them, when you look in their eyes, and I don't even know if you need to look in their eyes for it to happen, but when you look in their eyes, it's like you're instantly, and I hate using words like this, but it's like an instant download of thousands of pieces of information with images, with feeling, with everything all at once. Um, as I said before, like watching, you know, half a dozen, dozen movies at once and you're getting the whole lot. And so, when I look into the big one's eyes, there's this instant connection and it's quite overwhelming, really. And I'm, as I said, what didn't go away was the, um, the emotional sense of being overwhelmed. And it's not that you're overwhelmed because, you know, look, this is a big you know, alien and UFO and all that kind of crap. You're not overwhelmed by that experience at all. You're overwhelmed because somehow in their presence, energetically, you're totally naked. Every defense that you've got for yourself and... and what you would have ordinarily in interacting with any other being, a human being or whatever, it's gone. You're totally um, naked emotionally and you can't suppress or hide anything. This entire experience, that's how I am and they know everything. I, I can't, you know, pull out a question and ask something that, that I, that's half-hearted they know what you really want to know and they will say it before you even remember it. I think that's why to some extent I mustn't have asked the questions that were on my list. Well, I asked some of them but not all of them because there were more important things and I was ignoring them and they knew that. So with, the, with this conversation I begin to talk to them and and this female, she is huge. You know, I'm sitting down and um, looking up and, and sitting down, she must be at least six foot tall still, at least, you know, maybe eight foot, I don't know. So my head is still up and she's trying her best to um, connect with me and to, she's bending over and trying to make it easier. They're very compassionate, very considerate. They don't want us to suffer in any way. Suffering is kind of a byproduct of, of these relationships, these interactions. It's not something they deliberately do. And when people have interactions with them at night time, um, in their homes and things like that, it's not that they deliberately try to hurt you. And half the reason they do it at night time is because we're immobile and asleep and we're not aware of things. and they're trying not to upset us. If they did it in broad daylight, most people would freak out. So she's trying to be considerate and answering my questions and the answers, you know, with all of these things that that I talk about with the aliens, the answers aren't just a verbal answer. You get an image, you get you know, something up here that you can see and you get the emotional content. And that's pretty full on. Sometimes you think you're ready and you're not ready. And they usually know when you're not ready because they'll pull back or they won't, won't do something. And if you press them, they might do it, but they'll do it gently. I'm getting answers to the things that I asked before, the 12 questions. And it's quite overwhelming. And I think the little guys are with me because uh, 
One, I think they just want to make sure that my body is okay, and hence the reason the sound was created. And before they were putting their hands on different parts of my body, primarily at the, the back of the neck, to try and um, keep me right energetically in some way. But I think they're also here because they were able to help with the questions or the answers and also in case I was so um, overwhelmed emotionally by the things that I experienced, the answers that I heard, that I was affected physically and then they could do something about that. Now I don't remember them actually doing anything. I think I got through that okay but I'm not sure. Next thing I know, I don't actually remember you know, there are a lot of gaps in this whole experience. There are still many, many gaps. And there are many things that the, the psychics that I work with, um, as I say, call trigger points and have said, we need to go back to their trigger points. And they also know and, and pick up on the experience and are told, there's a whole lot there you don't know about. So there are, it's almost like a very disjointed kind of sequence. As I said before, you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out of this conscious reality. So I don't remember the part of this finishing. Maybe at a later date I'll find out a lot more, but at this point I don't remember this sequence finishing. I just remember the strangest feeling of floating. Um, I'm not really afraid of heights, but I know that if I stand, I, mean, I can climb these mountains and you know, hang off the rocks and feel fine, but if I climb a tall building, you know, if I climb, if I go up into a tall building, 20 story building, and I stand on the edge, you know, of a veranda, I'm going to get this kind of nervous feeling, and my, the palms of my hands will start getting all sweaty, and my feet will start feeling all funny. That's kind of the feeling I had that goes with this feeling of floating. Um, and I could see I was going higher and higher. Funny thing is, I don't remember seeing my body. Now later on, I remember this sense of coming together. And I know that sounds really corny. And the closest approximation I have to this, and I don't have any other way of understanding it, is uh, in Star Trek, you know that people are beamed up and beamed down and, and as I understand it their molecules are taken apart and then reassembled. Now I don't know if that's what happens. But it kind of feels like maybe it's something like that. All I know is um, I find myself floating I don't see a body and next thing I'm I'm in one of the craft up there. Yeah, so I'm going to take a minute out and then I'll come back and explain to you about what happened there. Yeah, there's some... When you go through this, it can get very emotional. And I need to just keep a few things in check and just clarify in my mind exactly what happened so I can convey it right. So I'll be back in a minute. Okay, I'm back. Um, I'm going to give you a really kind of abbreviated version of what happened next because I really want to write about this. I, I probably function better writing than, than talking about things. And when I write this when I write about this in the book, I think I'll then be able to elaborate on some of the details that are really hard to articulate verbally. So this will just be a brief version. I feel this sensation of floating, and I can see the ground going down, and I can see that I'm in some kind of light, some kind of energetic field, kind of strong, kind of yellowy colour. Um, hesitate to use the word sparkly, but there's an iridescence to it in some way. 
I go up and find myself in the ship and then there's a gap. I don't know what happened next. And I'm looking out what looks like a window. A very large window and I'm inside this craft that I assume is um, a craft vessel that belongs to the tall guys. So they're 14, 15 foot high. So inside this thing was absolutely huge. Um, you know, I don't even have a sense from looking at that craft how big it was. I could say maybe... Let me have a look. I don't know. Maybe 500 meters long. 400 wide, something like that. When I'm inside, um, what I would take to be a roof is absolutely huge. It's really big. Um, I, I don't even know how, how tall. It's just big. And what I see is this huge window. Window must be about, well, it's at least as high as those guys, so 14, 15 foot high. Um, maybe 20 foot long, something like that. Now, I don't know for sure it's a window, and I have a feeling it's actually the craft wall but it's turned into a window. Um, maybe the materials turn transparent. Maybe a window opens up. I don't know. And I'll say more about the interior after. But I'm looking out and it's very clear that we've already um, ascended a fair way. And I'm looking at the southern part of Australia. And then suddenly, I see the whole globe. And you know, we, we, I saw that we passed through the atmosphere. And this is the part that's, that's the shock. If anybody's ever been in a plane, you know there's a sense of pressurization as you go up. And uh, you can kind of feel, I guess, that this big thing is going against gravity. and. You know, there are changes in your body that you sense. It's very hard to articulate some of those, but there's this sense of, even in you know, pressurized cabins, there's a sense of pressure changes and you feel it in your ears. And you know, you sort of, it's a gradual kind of thing. What happened was it's instantaneous. You know, you're up there so quick. And what really shocked me, there was no sense of going against gravity, no sense of pressurization, nothing like that. Everything felt normal except there's this sudden acceleration that that's almost impossible to comprehend. And I'm watching I'm watching the continent that I know so well disappear underneath and I'm seeing other parts uh, you know of the world and then suddenly I'm seeing the whole globe and then suddenly the earth gets very very small and this was the hardest part um, I'm standing there with the, the female And I, I say to her, you know, I'm, I'm crying. And I'm sorry if I'm feeling that way now. I say to her, everything I know and love is down there. And I'm really frightened. at it all and there's this deep realization that that's everything I know that's my world and everybody I love somewhere down there 
and I'm a long way from them and I don't know when I'm coming back, if I'm coming back. And she comes over to me, she's next to me, she turns around and comes to me. And she's very gentle and she takes my hands. I can't remember her exact words. But she says to me not to be afraid that we won't be gone long and I'll be able to see my family again soon. And I don't know if she did something to me or she just said it to me, but a deep sense of peace um, kind of entered my heart. And whatever fear I had subsided. And we got to the point where Earth became just a tiny dot. And what shocked me, even even shortly after leaving the atmosphere, it's so dark out there. You think when you look up at the night sky, you know, the stars everywhere, it's so bright when you get out there. It's intensely dark. Yes, you see the luminousness of, um, of all the stars, but it's very dark. And you suddenly realize how... Um, far away everything is. And that was the sense that I had. This little dot, everything we've ever known is there, and we're in the middle of this huge space. And look, I can't I can't convey that to you. I can't I can't convey how that felt. You know, I know that stuff intellectually, but to see it, to feel it was something completely different. I'm guessing some astronauts know that feeling well. Um, but that far out, you know, it's a totally different feeling. I don't remember what happened after that immediately, but I remember looking. Um, there were two boomerang shaped consoles, very large. I don't really remember seeing any lights or anything on them. Um, I know there was a, a tall alien at one of them. And I came back and um, we sat down and I started to notice the floor. The floor was very smooth, kind of silvery colour and uh, knew it was artificial, but it didn't feel like you're in this um, ship that's full of this energy pulsing everywhere. It felt totally different. And I started to pay attention, and then I noticed that the little guys to the left of the window, you kind of see like, um, I'm assuming it was one side of the ship, but it might have just been one side of the room. I think it was one side of the ship and it had a gradual curving arc and the little guys were all seated there and I remember somehow I saw them when they went and sat down and I saw a couple get up and sit down again and it wasn't like they went and sat on a seat and got up walked away and the seat was there the vessel created a shape for them, created something for them to sit on. Um, it knew when they were going to sit down and it knew when they got up, whether to leave that or not. And what I realised as I moved around and talked to them that this ship is actually alive. I don't have a better word for it. Uh, you know, it looks like some kind of alloy, some kind of metal, but it responded to their needs, you know, it shaped and contoured what they needed, um, you know, a place to sit. Um, they would place their hands on the ship a lot, different places, and I don't know what they were doing. Maybe they were speaking to it in, in some way. 
and there were various projections around the ship. Um, I suppose we'd call them holograms, but these were very three-dimensional, none of the sense that you've got a projection here, like real things. And they were interacting with them, with their hands. Um, I don't want to say too much about the ship. I want to say something about what happened when I was up there. I saw there was also a smaller um, race, maybe six, seven foot. And at first I thought, I don't know why I thought this, because I knew better. I thought oh, maybe they're a different sex, but of course I knew that there was this kind of gender I don't even like using that word, but there was some kind of gender between the tall guys. But I realised these were a distinct race of their own. And they were much smaller and uh, also very thin. And they were interacting with the big guys. They were talking to one another and they were doing a lot of the... Um, I suppose you'd call it work. You know, in, inside the ship they seem to be monitoring things, um, interfacing with the projections. Yeah, and the little guys, they were mostly fairly, um, fairly stationary. They didn't do a whole lot. They were intensely um, interested in how I responded to what I was seeing, so a lot of the time they were watching me. But I didn't feel intimidated or anything like that. Um, once again, there's that intense feeling of... I hate using the word, but I can't think of another one. Intense feeling of love and compassion. So I want to tell you about um, something that we spoke about. I told you a little bit about what the little guys said. I think I missed something because um, when we were up there, there were some people came by and I had to talk to them. If I'm correct, one of the things that they said to me is, we are God incarnate. And there was a feeling and a felt sense and, a, and images that came with that. And I don't... I don't have a good way to explain that. For Christians, I suppose, who think of God being incarnated in the form of Jesus, um, maybe that's the nearest thing. I don't, I don't know how to explain that. There's two possibilities, you know. Everything is part of God. Everything is God. We are all God incarnate. Or... they are so self-aware they have become divinity itself. I, I don't have an answer. I don't know, I struggle with that. Um, and I know I had this discussion with them. There's things that... See, when it comes to the memories of this whole thing, there are things that I seem to be able to remember and other things I don't. And for the most part, I think I don't remember things because Physically and emotionally, I was overwhelmed, and that blocks it, like post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, it blocks it out. Anybody who's been in a war zone can tell you there's things they don't remember, and things they do. Anybody who's been through sexual abuse, uh, unless they've dealt with it, there are things they've blocked out. And I think it was kind of like that. But I think also there are a small number of things that they consciously block out, because they know that we're not ready to deal with it. And it's almost as if they can plant a seed so that when you're ready, that memory comes back, it resurfaces. So I think that's kind of what happens with a lot of it. When we had this discussion about um, God, and they had also said over there, uh, we are the beloveds. We're the ones who made you. 
they are referring, as I said, to our species, and I know they're one of four species who uh, help create our planet. And our planet uh, is more terrestrial than was originally intended. And they are one of four species who helped um, shape what has become Homo sapiens. And they, many of the aliens do continue to intervene, and what I think they are doing is trying to improve our emotions, our emotional state. So whether you buy that or not, I don't care. Uh, that's what I learned. So they were also referring to the fact that they created me, and I really struggled with that. And I mentioned Carnatec for a very good reason in that whole experience, how they asked him to take care of me more than 3,000 years ago. They told me they create souls. Now I can't tell you, this is one of those things that feels like it's blocked from my memory, I can't tell you if they create all souls every human soul or just some whatever I say is going to come with a whole bunch of questions and I don't have answers for them my gut feeling is they create some souls and you remember my you know, the rough things that I said about my Buddhist beliefs that flew in the face of everything so it was very difficult for me to understand that what they did then, I'm not going to tell you the detail, I'm just going to tell you a small part of what happened. We were talking about this idea of creating souls and how they created my soul. Um, and they wanted to show me something. So we went to another part of the ship and went behind. I'm not sure how far I walked, maybe 25 metres, something like that. And there was something like, um, a doorway's not a good description, kind of picture a, I don't know, kind of like a frame, if you like, and it was filled with kind of like a light field. The little guys, uh, two of the little guys came with me, and I believe the female, one came with me and took me through that field and I'm not going to tell you what was inside except to say that the amount of space physical space that was inside of that area um, was incredible it, it was as if we were no longer on the ship no longer on that vessel because it was huge, much bigger than that, whatever the 500 meters or whatever I, I thought maybe the ship was. It was an absolutely huge space. And in there, they showed me part of the process of creating souls. And I wasn't the same after that experience. When they came out, nothing felt the same. And I don't have answers to that, and I've got to do a lot of work to understand that before I write about it. Um, but it changed everything. I don't know how far they took me. I do remember at one point I couldn't see the earth. And I do remember that there were numerous other entities on board. So you, it's almost like you have a community on these ships. You don't just have one species. I mean, the, the little guys, the big guys, the ones I didn't know, and there were two or three others that I saw. Um, they interact with one another. They don't have hostility for one another. They don't have um, the kind of differences that we do. And for the most part, um, They seemed very orderly about what they were doing and um, like they worked together well. 
there were things I saw beyond that that frame, that door, whatever you want to call it, that defy explanation. And one day I hope to be able to write about that. I hope to be able to see it again and to remember it better. Um, One of the things I learnt is that some of them live in excess of a hundred thousand years. Now years is a kind of human idea. You know, it's, for us a year is 365 days going around the sun. For them it's something completely different. Using the human idea, a year is uh, you know, how long it takes a planet to go around a sun. But in other parts of the universe, this notion of time is measured, when it's measured, quite differently. So I think they're giving me an approximation of these creatures having mortal lives in excess, some of them in excess of 100,000 years. So I learned at this point, what they told me before about interacting with Carnatic, what I assumed back when he was, no, they told me when he was alive, but I assumed that actually were there then, 3,000 years ago, means that they're at least that old, but they may well have been able to move back in time. But I learned from them that they can certainly live a long time. Uh, I don't know about the tall guys, and I, sorry, I was referring to the little guys when I said that, but maybe the tall guys live equally long, maybe longer, I don't know. There's something about these two races, though, the, um, the brownies and the tall guys. They have, both have a very deep empathy, a very deep compassion, a universal compassion, as I said, and most of the aliens do. But these are almost like the creators, the creator beings. Um, something I learned from somebody a while back was when you meet other aliens they know if you've had contact with these ones they can sense it. There's kind of a reverence there. Um, there may be some aliens that are closer to us in terms of their evolution and I don't mean really close but relatively speaking but these other guys have been around for maybe billions of years and they've seeded large areas of, the, of what we would take to be the universe with life, with planets, with solar systems, the whole thing. So they share what they feel you're ready for. And you don't always know yourself if you're ready for it, but they seem to know. I had other experiences of being on board before, but nothing like this. And nothing like this kind of interaction with multiple races at once. Now I said before I was going to tell you what the short guys were called. I don't know if I, I don't recall that I did, so I better tell you. And this is my spelling, not theirs. Uh, they call themselves Tilhia. And that's T-E-A apostrophe H-I-A. T-E, oh sorry, T-E-A-L apostrophe H-I-A, teal here. I'm not going to tell you what the tall guys are called because some of them are um, working on Earth with humans. Um, I don't, I'm not going to go there. Maybe I'll write about that one day. Um, so this is that's that part. I'm up here and I have. Um, numerous things happen when I'm on board the craft and as I said as well um, earlier I have one kidney because um, I lost it to cancer and I still have cancer and because of the one kidney I have to go to the toilet quite a lot so you know I have to deal with pragmatic things like that and food when I'm on board the craft um, but they're able to provide everything you need I'm not going to talk about that, I'm going to write about that later, but what I want you to understand is not what these guys look like, not what their ships look like, not what the technology is like, but what they're like. They have a great reverence for life. And you know, I must have interacted with more than 30 beings on that night, 
And they all treated me like I mattered. They all treated me with great reverence, great compassion, and I would say love. And when they said, we are the ones who created you, we are the ones who created you, and then they were referring to our race, uh, to our, to human, humans, homo sapiens. Um, it's as if, um, and I don't like using this word, so please forgive me, it's not the best fit. It's as if uh, we are their children, and they nurture us and care for us because they gave us life. Now sure, my mother and father created me in an act of procreation, but um, in terms of my soul, whatever you want to call that, it's very clear to me now that I was created by, I assume that Telia, uh, maybe multiple races, you know, they are able to do this. They are able to do what to us seems impossible. I don't even have a comprehension of what that really means. You know, I may have seen something, but I can't comprehend it. That's all I want to tell you about on board the craft take you over there, uh, some emus there at the moment, so you might see them if we're lucky, and tell you what I thought happened on the night, because remember, I walk through this area, and I'm walking over there, ready to set up and begin the night, totally unaware that any of this had actually happened. Um, what I can tell you, as I said, is I was brought back down, and I had this strong sense because I could see the ground coming of being um, reassembled. I don't have a better word for it. Coming together as if I was made out of light or something and uh, you're solidifying. It's very hard to describe. I think that I must have come down somewhere near here, maybe not the same spot, somewhere near here and I continued to walk over because I remember that walk a little bit. So we'll go over there and finish the rest and hopefully see some emus. In case they get spooked when we head over, uh, there's some of my resident friends. Those little ones are babies. Most of the rest are females. Okay. See you over there. Okay, so I find myself um, over here, and what I think has happened is that I've walked over here as part of the walk down, you know, I left home about quarter to nine, something like that. And I check my watch and I set up um, a tripod here. When I check my watch, it's 9.15. So approximately half an hour has gone. And it's normally a 15 minute trip. So that kind of seems a bit strange straight away. I set up um, camera here and I go over here. About here. I go over there and I start saying the, um, going through the normal ritual that I use for contact and connecting with the spirits of the earth, and, you know, the different energetic um, aspects of this area. Um, I sit down for what I think is about half an hour and meditate as well. Uh, what I found from experience is connecting with that stillness is a good way to feel their presence. I used to use a method, a lot like Stephen Greer does, kind of like remote viewing of connecting with them, but I abandoned that and realized that feeling was more important. They know where you are anyway, you don't need to vector them in. I was doing that and then I had the experiences that I thought I had that you can read about on the blog in terms of this encounter. You know, the lights, there were lights appearing on the mountains and above me and here and on the mountains over there. So I'm having these lights go on and off and do all the things that they do and I'm 
thinking that's what's happening and I can feel their presence as well and I'm having at one point telepathic conversation with one of them but I, I think I'm having this very conventional experience and I don't remember what's happened over there and at one point uh, I decided to start taking photos and I kind of sounds a bit corny I lose interest in the whole thing thinking it didn't eventuate tonight um, and the mosquitoes get really bad at one point I'm lying down I've got a beanie on it's quite cold at night uh, at one point I even pull the beanie down to screen out the mozzies they're that bad because we've got a wetland at the back you know, plenty of mozzies here and that was the conscious part of the experience and then towards the end as I say I'm lying down and I look up and I see the three lights two at the front one at the back in a constellation of formation and they move towards the belt of Orion and the first two disappear and then the last one disappears that's the conscious encounter in recollection uh, what I remember is walking over um, walking over to that roughly that point that I showed you and I'm lying down at one point I'm lying down facing that way with my feet and I lift the beanie and I look up and I see the tall guys around me I see two or three no there's three tall guys and um, I think it's the other tall one that came down they attach some kind of uh, I don't have a word for this it's some kind of mechanical device kind of like a cuff around my ankles and they're doing something energetically to my body and I remember them telling me what they were doing and then that's it I don't remember any more interaction with them and then of course I had that conscious sort of recollection of seeing the lights and then I went home and it was you know, quarter past twelve or something when I got home and as far as I was concerned wasn't much of a big deal of a night so that's it the real experience was very different and the conscious experience at the time was quite different memories are changed some aren't even real in terms of what I thought were real that consciously happened going back um, no time was not following the sequence I thought it was and that's what they have the ability to do to move time around we're about to run out of battery life so I'm gonna go home and do a bit of follow-up a few of those things that I raised that's essentially the encounter see ya Before I go home, here's another point of view of the contact site. Um, I was pretty much uh, down here for that second part and over here for the first part. Um, mountains there. And the craft, I guess, were probably about... Uh, yeah, it looks hard to tell with my finger in the picture there and the second one at the back. I later learned there was a third craft of the uh, tall aliens and the other two were somewhere um, kind of here and uh, here. Very hard to tell with the first ones, the Telia, whether that was some kind of mothership. Um, I think it was just a, I don't know, it was a big ship. Um, I think they were both independent craft. 
So that's basically where it happened and that this is basically where I have most of my conscious contacts. I chose this area because it's a nice open space and fantastic view of the night sky and great if you know people are going to uh, come and visit and call them people. Uh, I guess you'd say they're alien. And maybe the possibility that they are on my land. Um, just going over here, this is the area also that I've heard the big squealing alien moving through the forest. Looks like we've got a storm coming, so I'm going to head back and finish this if I can. Carbunga. Here's the final view of the contact site. Um, kind of out there and... Look it up.